be over soon. Please, I don't want this, please. Please. Dr. Ewan Cameron was president of the American and Canadian Psychiatric Associations. He ran the Allen Memorial Institute, which was founded in 1943 with funds from the Rockefeller Foundation. Nazi paperclip scientists made their way into the CIA in military-sponsored mind control programs here in the United States and Canada. Some of these scientists were friends of Dr. Cameron. Money for Dr. Cameron's operation came from the CIA and was funneled through the Cornell Society for the Investigation of Human Ecology. The systematic annihilation or depatterning of a subject's mind and memory was accomplished with overdoses of LSD, barbiturate sleep for 65 days at a stretch, and electroshock therapy at 75 times the recommended dosage. Psychic driving repetition of a recorded message for 24 hours a day programmed the empty mind. The Canadian government settled a class action lawsuit by 250 former patients of Dr. Cameron decades later, but no person or institution has ever been disciplined or punished for these activities. Linda McDonald was 25 years old in 1963 when Dr. Cameron treated her for mild postpartum depression she received 102 electroshock therapy treatments, 80 days of drug-induced sleep, and emerged completely depatterned, essentially like a newborn, totally incontinent, unable to state her name or recognize her husband and children. She had to relearn how to drive, cook, read, and use a toilet. Eventually, unlike many of Dr. Cameron's patients, she made a fairly complete recovery. Dr. Cameron was the premier psychiatrist of the 20th century. He had studied Nazi scientists at the Nuremberg trials and later replicated many of their methods and sought their assistance in the race to control the human mind. Dr. Cameron's mind control experiments were one program out of many programs run by the CIA, Navy, Air Force, Army, and others. Although many parallel programs were occurring in the United States, none of them were ever discovered or prosecuted. These programs were run by Dr. Morse Allen, Dr. L. Wilson Green, Dr. Martin T. Orne, Dr. Stephen Aldrich, Dr. James Hamilton, and others. These American and foreign-born programmers supervised by Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, who was in turn supervised by Richard Helms and the director of the CIA, Alan Dulles. Hi, this is Peter Bregan. I'm a psychiatrist, and this is one in my series of simple truths about psychiatry. Today, I'm going to talk to you about electroshock treatment or shock treatment abbreviated as ECT in capital letters. And of course, many of you might ask if you've gotten this far a while after you're hearing about shock treatment, because frankly, it's being done to hundreds of thousands of your neighbors. We don't know exactly how many. The common estimate is 100,000 people a year. The only reason that's the common estimate, it's the one I made from available data in 1979 and in the first and only medical book critical of shock treatment. So going back to 79, believe me, there's a lot more going on boss, now. Boss. Every city in America has hospitals, usually several that are doing shock treatment, not far from me in Syracuse. Uh, we are within a short drive of several places that do shock treatment. They love to do shock treatment. It's extremely remunerative. And according to the meager statistics we have, because the shock docs hide the data, the vast majority of shock treatment is currently being done to elderly women. Why elderly women? Well, they're vulnerable, they have no one to protect them, and it gets paid for by Medicare. You all right? 
Um, so, Mrs. Goldfarb, we've tried uh, several medications and you don't seem to be responding. I believe we might be at a point where we might want to try some alternative methods. Uh, we've had excellent results with ECT in the past. Um, so if I can just uh, get your John Hancock, we'll get underway. It's not very complicated. Shock machine will keep your average psychiatric unit in the general hospital making money. And the doctors making money. What is shock treatment? Shock treatment was invented back in 1938 during a period of time when psychiatrists were looking for new and better ways to inflict brain damage on people. It's not like today where they lie and say the treatment's harmless. It was, frankly, part of the whole search for lobotomy and, and shock. And Soletti and Beanie in uh, Italy found out that there were um, pigs being knocked out with jolts to the head of normal electricity, gave them a seizure, they fell to the ground, and if they weren't slaughtered, they would get up, they'd be wobbly, and they'd walk away. And that gave them the idea this might be a good way to administer shocks to human beings using electricity. They've been causing convulsions with drugs. They've been causing convulsions, for example, by overdosing patients with insulin coma. They knew it caused brain damage. This is something you got to understand, folks. My colleagues knew it caused brain damage because they would look at the slides of the brains of people who died during insulin coma, which was not uncommon, and they'd see dead brain cells. Uh, the argument back in those days was that they were killing bad brain cells. Remember, lobotomy came out of that same period. Clearly, you're killing brain cells if you chop up the front of the brain with a scalpel or if you pour um, formaldehyde into the brain or if you put, more recently, radium seeds into the brain. I mean, nobody's denying you're killing brain cells. You see, psychiatry has a history of killing brain cells. The only reason that the modern shock doctors no longer talk about damaging the brain as being the treatment, the only reason they don't do that now is because I publicized it way back in 79 and quoted all of them, and it really made for bad PR. So now shock treatment is supposed to correct biochemical imbalances. Well, first, there aren't any imbalances, and second, the only thing a blow to the brain can do is disrupt all its functions. Shock treatment involves the application of electrodes. Usually, bilateral ECT is still what's used to both sides of the head, causing a major convulsion far stronger and more harmful and dangerous than an ordinary spontaneous seizure that people with epilepsy have. In fact, the convulsions are so powerful that things happen to people that don't happen to epileptics. In animals, you get brain damage, cell death, small hemorrhages throughout the brain. And in fact, they're so physically powerful, more powerful than ordinary seizures, that uh, before they started paralyzing the muscles, people would break their spine, if they would be held, they'd break their limbs from this overwhelming power of these seizures. Sometimes the electrodes are placed so that only one's over the frontal and temporal lobe. This is where your frontal lobe is and also the tip of your temporal lobe. And they'll put one further back on your head. The idea being that maybe it would be less damaging to do it on one side of the head, particularly the side of the head that wasn't the language center. Well, all that happens from that is it's a little uh, harder for the person to realize what's happened to them. Now the damage is actually more focused in a narrower area, causes at least as much damage as bilateral. But then again, maybe not, because, quote, it doesn't do as much good. And since the damage is the trick, most docs don't use the new kinds of electro placements. They use the old kinds. Now let's talk about new electroshock. Oh, Bregan doesn't know what he's talking about. We have new modified forms. Well, one of the sins of my life is that I gave new modified forms of shock treatment as a psychiatric resident at Harvard in 1963 and 4. I want to take a breath and tell you that I've spent a lot of time setting up a free website so that if you hear somebody's about to get shock treatment, 
You can go on the website. You can print out a color brochure to give them. It's all free. And look at well over 100 PDFs of articles about brain damage from shock, about women becoming more submissive to their husbands, about doctors shocking women to make them more submissive to their husbands. It's all there documented. About people losing much of their memory for their whole lives. All documented. The animal studies. All documented. It's on ectresources.com. When shock treatment is done, certainly by the second or third one, let alone 8, 9, 10, or 20, the person wakes up after a period of coma. You go into a coma. How could that not be harmful to the brain? How could a blow to the brain with electricity so severe cause a coma? And you're not harmed by it. In addition, very often, the, if uh, they're doing brain waves and EEG, the what? brain wave flatlines. What does that mean? That's brain death. It's a temporary, brief, several seconds long period where your poor brain is so exhausted from the mass of seizure, the electricity, the hypertension, the breakdown of the blood vessels inside the brain that it stops working. You wake up in a completely disoriented state. Most of the time you don't know you had shock treatment. You don't know what's happened to you. You can't remember the treatment. And gradually as the treatments increase, you lose more and more of your past memory. I have seen marvelous professional people, men and women, who could no longer function in their professions. And I'm proud to say I was the medical expert in the very first electroshock malpractice victory a few years ago. You, it is dismaying that this still goes on. Why does it go on? Because when you've been concussed again and again, you stop complaining. In fact, initially, you might get euphoric. I've read hospital record after hospital record. When the patient gets the euphoria of brain injury, the doctor says, mood elevated. I think it's evil to damage somebody's brain, make them silly and giddy, and write in the record, mood elevated or mood improved. They don't even usually say elevated, mostly just improved. But after a few of them, the patient doesn't even know what's happened to them. Were they sexually abused? They can't remember. Is their husband beating them? They can't remember. Is he threatening to leave them? They can't remember. Is the husband, and mostly these are women, is the husband having an affair? They can't remember. They become indifferent and apathetic, which happens from injury to the brain. They don't care, they don't feel them, they don't remember, and the doctors call it a cure. But only unscrupulous family members consider it a cure. Because it's not a cure. It's a horrible injury. I kill you. I'm just gonna hurt you. Really, really bad. You think so? Well, I can take it. I wouldn't want you to break those perfect porcelain cap teeth when the juice hits your brain. They became the king and queen of Gotham City. I was tired, I was depressed, my back was hurting. And so he said to the children's father, why don't you go to Montreal and visit this Dr. Ewan Cameron, this famous man who has all of these accolades, and have an assessment. So we went. My medical file even says that I took my guitar with me. And uh, that was the end of my life. Within three weeks, Dr. Cameron decided to call me an acute schizophrenic and ship me up to the sleep room. I was in a, a, a coma for 86 days. 86, 86 days of unbroken comatose. sleep. Total comatose state. I was, had to be toilet trained. I was a vegetable. I had no identity. I had no memory. I'd never existed in the world before. A, like a baby. Just like a baby that has to be toilet trained. Pictures, and I know who that is, who they are, but I don't remember them as my children at all. Hmm. I mean, I know that they came from my body, um, but there's no, that's all.
I don't know, and that's because I was told that. Mm. So these are my children. I'm stubborn too. It got to the point where every time, whether it was John Crosby or uh, Raina Titian or then the, the Honorable Tim Campbell, it got to be, uh, you guys, we're gonna, we're gonna stay alive. I, and I said that to Brian Mulroney too. If you think I'm going away, you've got another thing coming. I'm not going to go away. <laughs> Discovered Linda McDonald would hound the federal government for four years before finally in 1992, Ottawa grudgingly agreed to compensate her and some of Dr. Cameron's other victims $100,000 each in exchange for signing away the right to sue the government or the hospital. But it was an ambiguous victory. Ottawa refused to acknowledge any wrongdoing at the Allen, a conclusion backed up by a legal review of what happened there. It was an awful feeling to realize when I found this out that the man whom I had thought cared about what happened to me didn't give a damn. I was a fly, just a fly. <laughs>